speaker is Lou Lanzarote, who will be talking to us about space weather and technology. Um, Lou has um, received his bachelor's degree in engineering physics from the University of Illinois. And he, oh, oh, sorry. Um, Lou received his bachelor's degree in engineering physics from the University of Illinois and his uh, master's and PhD in physics from Harvard. He's employed at Bell Laboratories um, since 1965 and is presently on the consulting staff at Bell Lucent Technologies. He served as an adjunct professor of electrical engineering at the University of Florida and as a regents lecturer at UCLA. His principal research in interests include space plasmas, geophysics, and engineering problems related to the impact of space processes on space and terrestrial technologies. He served or is serving in numerous national and international organizations. Just some of his current posts include the Vice President of Coast, Coast Bar, um, the Chair for the Committee on Public Affairs of the AGU, um, the chair of the survey study for solar and space physics, which is currently underway. He is a member of the governing board for the American Institute of Physics, and he has published over 500 science and engineering papers and is a co-author or, or co-editor of three books. He has seven patents that are issued or pending. He was elected to the National Academy of Engineering and the International Academy of Astronautics. He is a fellow of the IEEE the American uh, Geophysical Union, the American Institute of Aeronautics and Astronautics, the American Physical Society, and the American Association for the Advancement of Science. He has received NASA's Distinguished Scientific Me Achievement Medal and has twice received NASA's Distinguished Public Service Medal. He is also unique in that he has a minor planet, 5504, uh, Lanzarote, which recognizes his space and planetary research, and he even has a mountain, Mount Lanzarote, um, in the uh, at 74.83 degrees south and 70.55 degrees west, which recognizes his research in the Antarctic. Louis. Thank you for the introduction. As indicated, I will be speaking about. Uh, Space weather, yeah, I'm going, to, I'm going to want to use the other view graph probably. Space weather effects on technologies, a tutorial, science, engineering, and policy. With due apologies to Jack Fellows, who's actually the chair of the AGU Public Affairs Committee right now. I was former chair some time ago. That must be ill. Okay. Um, because I, I have taken, uh, I've taken uh, the advice of several members of our section uh, who advised me on the uh, tutorial lectures here. And I'm going to talk about science and engineering. We're going to use some historical perspective to bring to bear some of the issues that I want to address on space weather. And I'm also going to talk about some policy issues, and they'll be interleaved throughout this uh, discussion because some of these are very, very important and sort of guide research and guide the way one thinks about space weather. Also, uh, because of advice that I've received, particularly from Nancy Cooker, uh, I'm, going, uh, I'm going to talk about specific sessions and some, some special papers. Uh, that's always dangerous to highlight some talks or papers or sessions because those who aren't highlighted will be unhappy and those who are will be happy, but maybe I misquote them. But nevertheless, I think it will be important to highlight some of the papers that will be given because they do fit into the general aspect of some of the policy issues in particular that I want to address as we go forward here. Well, I think, um, I, think it, I, I, do want to do, I do want to discuss some things in historical context because they, they do address the issue of space weather in, a, in a quite a good fashion. Some 150 years ago or more, the telegraph was just being installed uh, throughout the, uh, just after Samuel Morris uh, devised the first practical telegraph. There have been a number of telegraphs over the la over 50 years prior to uh, the mid, uh, uh, the first third of the uh, 19th century. But uh, Samuel Morris finally perfected the, uh, the first operating and useful telegraph. And it became instantly popular and important for use. Uh, 
uh, for human communication, particularly with government and then for individuals. Uh, and the telegraph began installed in Europe uh, and in the, in the eastern part of the United States. But what was seen on the early telegraph was also, often there were effects on the telegraph lines that were not understood. For example, here are some data that were taken on the telegraph line from Derby uh, to Birmingham, England in uh, 1847 by, uh, by a chap named Barlow. And in fact, Barlow was the, uh, Barlow was the uh, chief engineer of the, of the telegraph uh, system uh, in England at that time, the Midra Midland Railway, who ran telegraph lines along the railroad tracks at that time for communication with railroad, just like we're doing now. We're running fiber optic cables along the railroad lines and the pipelines in the United States just now because the right-of-way exists. That's very interesting to keep that historical analogy in mind. The telegraph is no longer a viable technology, and, we'll, and that will come forward too as we talk about space weather going forward. But what Barlow saw were some data like this, fluctuations in the electrical currents on his telegraph lines, which varied over the course of the two-week interval that are plotted here. This is a weekend, and Barlow didn't work on the weekends, <laughs> unlike many geophysicists that I know today. But there were large fluctuations during this one week and smaller fluctuations during this next week. And Barlow observed and pointed out in a paper that he published in the Journal of Royal Society that the observations described in it were taken under consequence of certain spontaneous deflections that had been noticed in the needles of the electric telegraph in the Midland Railway the ex erection of which was carried out under my superintendency as the company's engineer. Barlow made those measurements not because he was a geoscientist and was out trying to un investigate nature, but because he was an engineer and he wanted to understand the effects of something on his system, which he didn't understand. It's a very important concept to remember for space weather uh, research. He also observed that in every case which has come under his observation, the telegraph needles have been deflected when aurora have become visible. And in fact, if you take Barlow's data, which he tabulates very nicely in his paper, uh, data were very simple and few bytes uh, per uh, day at that time, uh, and you can replot Barlow's data, and you can replot them, and they look like this, if you take the medians of all those data. And here's the, here's the data plotted as a function of local time for those two weeks on two telegraph lines, Derby to Birmingham and Derby to Rugby, and you see there's a very nice diurnal variation. This is probably the first evidence of a diurnal variation in the telluric currents and therefore the SQ pattern in the ionosphere ever seen. And it was done, it was seen before by, by magnetic field measurements, of course, but it was done by an engineer who was working on a very practical problem that somehow he didn't know but was related to space weather. Very important as we go forward into the future and talking and thinking about space weather. In contrast, in 1859, Robert Carrington, a British solar physicist, was had been in the process and was in the process of mapping sunspots for some two or three years on the surface of the sun. And Carrington very carefully mapped every day the location of sunspots that he could see from his observatory. He compiled this into a rather thick book that he, uh, that he had. Up at the top are plotted the first half of a sunspot cycle, uh, a, a Carrington rotation. This was Carrington of Carrington, and of course that's where the name comes from, but he didn't call this a Carrington rotation. This is the first half of Carrington rotation, 13 days or so. This is the second half of Carrington rotation. These are the, t these are the dates up here. This, you can't see very well, obviously, from where you are, but this starts with, from August 11, 1859, to September 6th down here, uh, 1859. These are each of these grid marks at 20 degrees latitude, and it was a very large spot here in August 31st and September 1st, 1859. Carrington, in fact, watched that spot very carefully, and he pointed out and wrote in his book of, uh, that the observation of this very splendid group on September 1st has had a, some notoriety he witnessed a singular outbreak of light which lasted about five minutes and moved sensibly over the contour of the spot. The first observation of a white light solar flare event. Now, simultaneously with Carrington's scientific, scientific research, folks running telegraph systems, 
in the East Coast of the United States and in Europe saw some very interesting things too. Of course, they, no there was no communication between these groups at the time, immediately thereabouts. But uh, some, some, some later publications, American Journal of Art, Science and Arts, and also Prescott in the same journal, uh, reported that arcing and sparking of telegraph keys and armatures were reported from a wide range of stations all over eastern United States and, and in Europe. These are terminologies used at that time for the governmental uni units in Europe. Obviously, Württemberg is part of Germany now, for example. In Christiana, Norway, this is a quote, sparks and in, in uninterrupted discharges were observed from time to time. Pieces of paper were set on fire. This paper was what was being used to record the telegraph signals. Uh, at, at the time, and these were paper that were uh, set on fire. And in fact, some telegraph stations burned down over the la in the course of the last latter half of the 19th century from these kinds of occurrences. On the line from Boston to Portland, Maine, Prescott reports on Friday, September 2nd, the operation operators continued to use the line without batteries for about two hours. When the Aurora, having subsided, the batteries were resumed. Uh, so putting this together, obviously, it appeared that pure research our basic research identified a possibility, only a possibility, that somehow the sun was involved with some of these engineering issues that arose in practical technology. Again, space, space weather, the word was not used, uh, the phrase was not used at that time, of course, and in fact, even for about a 50 years there, there was a considerable debate as to whether the sun could really influence the earth in this way and cause these kind of technological changes. So, we have two examples from 150 years ago, roughly, of one where engineering and practical problems drove issues of trying to understand the natural phenomena, whereas, and also where observation of natural phenomena gave new insights to possible impacts on technologies. So, what is space weather? I don't know. Uh, there's no good definition. My definition, my operational definition over the last decade or two, uh, three decades that I've been working in this with colleagues at Bell Labs and uh, in government is that space weather are processes in the solar terrestrial system that can affect technological systems in deleterious ways. Well, we all know what solar terrestrial system is. It's everything from the sun to the inflationary medium to the earth and everything around the earth. But what are these processes and what are these technical systems? And that makes a difference as to how we approach uh, research and understanding in space weather. Well, the motivation of the uh, processes is how does one know which processes are relevant for study and understanding? All of us have in our minds what these processes in the solar terrestrial system, but how do we know which ones we, can, we should study and how do we know which ones are relevant? And papers here at this AGU and other AGUs address these kinds of questions. Technical systems. How does one know which technical systems may be vulnerable to solar terrestrial Processes. When you turn on your TV every morning, you don't worry about a solar terrestrial process. When one, when one uh, toasts one's bread in the morning, one doesn't worry about solar terrestrial processes. So how do you know which are, which are relevant? And which are, how does one put a perspective on the kinds of impacts that might occur? Well, the motivation of research really drives the answers in some ways. Uh, and I, I uh, very, very schematically and uh, certainly argu uh, arguably, one can, one can talk about four kinds of research here, which we often do. Basic research, almost any research in the solar terrestrial system will ultimately be of interest in solar terrestrial and space weather. No question about it. But is the time scale for achieving understanding for some of, these, uh, for some of this research re realistic for practical use? So is it really a space weather kind of activity or not? After all, research never ends. There's always new questions. You learn something, you go, you go on. You ask new questions. Now, I, uh, I was tempted to illustrate some examples of research that may or may not be relevant under basic research, and I resisted that temptation. Applied research. Research efforts towards, targeted towards likely applicability of new understanding. That's, uh, that's pretty interesting. Applied research, I could, would call research efforts targeted towards likely applicability of new understanding. It's the kind of thing that I've often done most of my career. Targeted research. Systems problems or uncertainties drive specific solar terrestrial research objectives. And I'll, I'll uh, illustrate this with uh, some examples uh, uh, in, in a little bit later and also point out some talks here that are probably, some papers here that are probably uh, targeted toward 
uh, both of these kinds of activities. And then development. I would call development are designing solar terrestrial uh, processes insofar as they're known out of the equation to get the product out the door, basically. What can we learn about solar terrestrial physics so we can design any questions about space weather out of the system and just forget it in the future? And that's possible. I mean, obviously, we're doing it now. Otherwise, we won't have, wouldn't have a lot of the technology that exists. And, and much, much engineering research and, uh, and, and activities in the government and the civilian sector are directed towards this development. But in order to get there, of course, one has to know some more basic understanding, and, uh, and that drives some of this research done by uh, many of you. Now, as I said, this could be very argumentative, and I'm willing to discuss that. Well, what we have found, I think, over the, over the course of the last years, last four decades, last 150 years, that in the last 150 years, the variety of technologies that are embedded in space-affected environments have vastly increased, and I will come to those shortly. However, what we've also seen is the increasing sophistication of technologies and how they relate to the environments in which they're embedded it means that ever more sophisticated understanding of the physical phenomena is needed. And again, we get back to allocating. What is space weather? How does one decide what basic research to do? How does one decide uh, whether or not as something as applied research or targeted research, or how, how do we go about this? But th these things we know for sure, and we need to guide our space weather research in a large, in a large fashion by these kinds of activities. Now, to, to illustrate further with some more historical data, in the last 150 years, a variety of technologies are embedded in space affected environments have vastly increased. One can, one can show some data here, which you'll see in a moment is not totally irrelevant. And in fact, here are some data from a magnetic storm uh, taken on a wireless transmission to Europe uh, in 1928, July 1928. Technologies changed. Marconi's, Marconi's uh, I wouldn't say invention, but Marconi's demonstration, for which he won the Nobel Prize, that one could send a transmission from England to North America, revolutionized communications. One could now, uh, uh, with uh, less infrastructure, send messages vast distances without laying cables, without putting all the power and supplies for cables. One could have a higher bandwidth at that time. One could uh, begin to think about sending voice uh, over large distances and not just dots and dashes as one had with the telegraph. Uh, so what, what, uh, what a great deal of research began into understanding the efficacy of uh, wireless transmissions. And here we see a, an example of understanding at the time or an investigation that was targeted, targeted towards geophysics, but because we wanted to, because an understanding of wireless was desired. This is a magnetic field, a horizontal component of the magnetic field. Uh, I think it was taken down in Virginia. There was a station in Maryland or Virginia, Chelatum, that was uh, typically used at that time. There were data here on transmissions at 18 megahertz from New Jersey to England, and transmissions at very long waves, 60 kilohertz, from Long Island to Scotland. And it's quite clear during this magnetic disturbance, it was clear to the engineers that if, a, if an occurrence like this occurred, one could switch the transmission, of course, losing a lot of bits, losing a lot of bits, the carrying capacity, but one could switch transmission, and that is also in, important for space weather, one could switch the transmission from uh, relatively uh, shorter wavelengths to relatively longer wavelengths and still maintain contact across the Atlantic. And in fact, Marconi noticed that and, and made some comments about that. And uh, I mean, a lot of writers, uh, a lot of engineers at the time did, but it's interesting to, uh, to relate to, to quote Marconi here. He said that in times of bad fading, which I, I just showed you on that previous U-graph at 18 megahertz, uh, practically always coincide with the appearance of large sunspots and intense aurora boreali. It's exactly what we saw in the context of the telegraph. And he, he points that out. These are the same periods when cables, telegraph cables and telecommunication cables at that time, and landlines experience difficulties are thrown out of action. And in fact, 10 years after Marconi, the New York Times basically illustrated in a headline on a Sunday morning, exactly pointed out between the switch from 
high relatively shorter wavelengths to longer wavelengths. Violent magnetic storm disrupts shortwave radio communication, transatlantic surfaces, transfer phone and other traffic to very to long wavelengths as sunspot disturbance strikes. Well, this issue about high frequency communications is not one that has gone away, in fact. And indeed, here's a view graph that Bob Hunsucker put together for me uh, from some research in space weather that, is, uh, that has gone on and is still going on. There's a lot of research like this related to space weather because government agencies, and particularly the Department of Defense, uh, still use relatively uh, high, low, I, I would call, uh, uh, long wavelength transmissions, but here's, here's some data that, uh, they, uh, of a transmission, the amplitude of a transmission from a spot here called Wales to Fairbanks and the mid-aurora is right here, uh, this line, showing the large variation in the amplitude of this HS frequency transmission in 1993. So this is quite still of some relevance to governmental entities, uh, but now we have a lot more diagnostic information. And of course, here's a photograph. This is a photograph of the ionosphere at the time, or the upper atmosphere, from uh, the DMSP spacecraft showing all the intricacies of the auroral arcs that we all know and love so well. And these intricacies of the auroral arcs, of course, are produced by solar terrestrial processes, which can affect this high frequency transmission. But in terms of the commercial arena, in terms of the commercial arena, these kinds of frequencies, these kinds of transmission, are pretty irrelevant. And so one sees a bifurcation in some ways of the governmental interests for their own purposes and special, special purposes, very special purposes, and the commercial purposes as well. And that also is an important aspect of considerations of space weather, what processes and what is important and what may not be important. Okay, well, in the last 150 years, as I said, the, the variety of technologies that can be affected by space weather processes has vastly increased. And that's illustrated both in this historical view graph on, on your right and the illustration on your left of the near space, the near Earth technologies that can be affected. But I think this historical timeline is of some is some interest to spend just one moment at. Uh, we've indicated here the sunspot cycles up until about the present. Here are uh, some impacts on, and, and this, this is quasi-color coded here, impacts on, on systems on the ground like telephone and, and power, no, not power so much, but telephone and, uh, and telegraph are indicated here in black. There were impacts on the England Telegraph, Florence Pisa Telegraph. They continued throughout this time until the telegraph became an obsolete technology. Uh, there are disturbances on radio, uh, disturbances here on telecommunications as well, and also disturbances on specific uh, telephone lines, both in the continental United States here and in, uh, in cables across the Atlantic. And these continue today to some extent, even, with, even often with fiber cables. Uh, back here, the white light flare was observed, New England telegraph uh, disruptions in Europe. Uh, at this time, the impacts on uh, space processes on, on uh, power systems became evident and the magnetic disturbances of March 1940. At that time, power systems, electrical power systems in the United States were very localized in communities and not widespread, not interconnected as they are today. And it was a very large magnetic disturbance in March 1940 that first affected some of the local power systems in the United States, northern New York State, New Jersey, uh, and northern parts of the United States. And so that's why I targeted that here. At the same time, there were large telegraph uh, disturbances. And slightly later, in the Second World War, 1942, disturbances on the radar uh, systems being used in, in England and in Germany were observed, which were totally unknown and un, un, unrecognized as what they were at the time, but turned out to be uh, solar radio bursts, as indicated over on the view graph on your left there, uh, jamming the radar systems. And that has, become, that has continued as being an interest uh, today in the military and more recently in terms of wireless communication on the commercial sector, and we'll come back to that with a paper at this meeting. Uh, 
Uh, and then as we go on with the advent of the satellite era, communication satellites, uh, different surveillance satellites, uh, the onset of, this, of the space age may, means that we have a lot more concern about uh, issues of space weather on technological systems and on human systems in space. One of the, uh, so now let us, uh, let us look at a little more specifically at some, at some issues. Impacts of space weather. Oh, hang on. Excuse me. Impacts of space weather on technologies. One could list a whole variety of things here, which are sort of illustrated schematically on the view graph on your left, but there are changes in the ionosphere variations, induction of electrical currents in the Earth, which I've alluded to, can affect power distribution systems, long communication cables, land and sea pipelines, interference with geophysical prospecting. Actually, that's a source of geophysical prospecting. Uh, wireless signals, reflection, propagation, attenuation, satellite signals, communications, GPS, uh, interference, scintillation, these kinds of things. Magnetic field variations can affect compasses in the attitude control of spacecraft around Earth. Solar radio bursts can interfere with radar. Still an issue in the military. Can interfere with noise levels in wireless systems. Space radiation. Radiation in space can affect solar cells. Damage. Semiconductor device damage and failure. Faulty operation of semiconductor devices on the space and on the ground, as a matter of fact, and there's a fair amount of, of research done by some semiconductor uh, industry to, to uh, in investigate this uh, phenomena as they develop new systems. Spacecraft charging, surface and interior material. There are no papers at this meeting, as near as I can tell, on this particular subject. Astronaut safety, airline passenger safety. Micrometeorites and space debris. Normally not considered in space weather in the way most of us who tend to be space plasma physicists and associated uh, disciplines tend to think. But that micrometeorites are very, very, very important for this. Solar cell damage, damage and failure of mirrors, surfaces, materials, and entire vehicles. And just in passing, I should note that an issue at the geosynchronous is what is the micrometeorite environment at geosynchronous? How well do we know it? How, how much does it change? and what, if it changes, what are the reasons for it. And from the point of view of commercial industry, I can't say about the military, that's an important question that is not understood or answered, and we've not had any real measurements of that at geosynchronous, to the best of my knowledge, in the unclassified literature. And in the atmosphere, some new research has pointed a direction. This research is somewhat like Carrington's research. It's not a question that the engineers ask, but research on uh, on, uh, on how, the, uh, there might be a, uh, how there might be a coupling between the ionosphere and the thunderclouds and the thunderclouds on the ground and how that might preci affect precipitation, which in turn can affect some atmospheric scattering of wireless signals. And of course, the atmosphere produces low altitude satellite drag. And there's a paper here at the meeting on the drag as well. But some, some questions about, as I've, I've alluded to here on the uh, view graph here, rainfall and water vapor, Normally, you don't include that in space weather. Normally, one doesn't uh, think about that in terms of space plasma physics, but it could be important going forward. It could be a research direction that's pointing to an uh, area where we may need new scientific understanding and to provide some answers and some understanding for the engineering community. Well, let us, let us go on now a little bit to look at, um, to look at some specific uh, papers at this meeting. And going back to, uh, going back specifically to what is space weather. Some papers at this meeting that I would classify, for those of you who would like to, uh, who wish to go see them, uh, some, some papers on ionospheric variation that are, that are probably important for space weather going forward. For me, the per point of view of uh, pure research or applied research. And again, this is the induction of electrical currents in the Earth. By, and it affect power distribution systems, long communication cables, land and sea and pipelines. For example, there's a paper here, and I'm going to reclassify this and resort this in a moment. So you can list this as I have here, and you can resort these papers 
And those of you who may be involved in some of this research can research your research in different categories as well. Basic, applied, or development, for example. So uh, I think, and I think that's interesting from a policy standpoint for a researcher to think about how you sort out what you're doing and how you might explain what you're doing to your department head, your advisor, your, your funder, whom, whomever, your colleagues for that matter. Uh, this paper here by the Ionospheric Climatology over Millstone Hill. That looks like an interesting paper, and it could also be important for a more targeted research, as we'll come back to. There's a paper on ionospheric conductance, which obviously is important for understanding ionospheric currents in the Earth. Uh, uh, John Kaplan will be giving uh, a talk on electric grid forecasting. Very targeted research aimed directed towards the power system company, and the, the power system business. And it's also a private, uh, it's, it's, it's the private sector and not the government sector here. Uh, Pat Newell will be talking about auroral oval forecasting, a paper here on predicting induced fields on Earth, which of course is very important for understanding induction in the power system grid and in telecommunications as well. Uh, there's also a couple of papers that I've pointed out here on satellite signals, communications, GPS, etc. There's a paper here, a student-led paper, in fact, it's in a student-led session on equatorial spread S and its effects on the global positioning system, which is a very interesting paper. It's both relevant for GPS as well as for a wireless transmission through the equatorial regions. And in fact, this, this has been a, this, if I can put my hands on it, this has been an ongoing problem for quite some time. And in fact, it was originally discovered by engineering, not by science. Some of the first measurements made by ComSat in transmitting about one gigahertz to the ground, to the equatorial region, back at the beginning of the 1970s, when they wanted, to, when, when the first uh, communication, commercial vi commercially viable communication satellites were launched, ComSat noted there were a lot of scintillations on their signals through the equatorial ionosphere. And here's an example of one of the power spectra that they produced at the time. This is the frequency of the fluctuations in the power spectrum that they produced from ComSat, lab ComSat laboratories. Purely an engineering uh, measurement pointed to new interesting space plasma physics in the equatorial regions, which led or paralleled a lot of interesting work on equatorial plasma bubbles, the Rayleigh-Taylor instability, and all those nice things that space plasma physicists like uh, to study in the equatorial region. But the practicality of that was pointed out, and in fact, it was led by some of the research from ComSat. And of course, so this, this research here is a follow-on to those kinds of to those kinds of uh, studies that were initiated some 30 years ago. There's also a paper here by Belitza who uh, speaks about the reference ionosphere and follows that through. There is a paper here by Quigley and the Air Force who, uh, who is going to be discussing his studies of uh, solar radio bursts and their effects on military communications and particularly military radar systems and some military communication systems as well. Uh, now, we all know that there's large variations in the radiation environment around the Earth. The cosmic ray uh, environment here is measured at Newark, Delaware by the Neutron Monitor at the University of Delaware, the Barthol Institute here. The variability of that is shown throughout 1991. And here's the fluxes of energetic electrons. Uh, greater than 2 MeV from the GO spacecraft, the geosynchronous orbit. Large changes, factor of 10 to the, factor of, uh, 10 to the 6 here, over the course of 1961. And that occurs not atypically, particularly during solar maximum kind of periods. These kinds of uh, particle environments, uh, that these variabilities affect uh, technological systems in very, very interesting ways. And they will be discussed at this meeting to some extent. Uh, and I'll show those in a moment. Uh, here's the uh, magnetic field variations also that one sees uh, in, the, in the Antarctic, just to put a perspective on this. Um, in addition, so at this meeting, there will be discussions of space radiation by quite a large number of individuals. And I've enlisted some of those here that it looked interesting to me, and again, I, if I haven't listed yours, five minutes? I thought I had half an hour. 
My watch is done. Okay. Ah, well, I don't have, I got more, I have more than five minutes. Anyway, um, but there's 15 minutes of discussion, right? Okay. Oh, okay. Uh, Shay is going to talk about solar protons for five solar cycles. Uh, CMEs are going to be discussed uh, in solar protons that might be produced then. Electrons are geosynchronous, which I've just spoken about. Forecasting of the radiation belt by Zeng and uh, ra trap radiation databases will be discussed. And there are a couple papers here that are really related to human spaceflight and astronaut uh, safety. Uh, Don Smart on vertical cutoff rigidity models and uh, Go Lightly on support of manned space. And then, of course, there's, uh, there's a, there is a, some atmosphere papers, not as many as there are at the fall AGU in general. There's one here on solar soft x-rays and satellite drag. You, that's one of the issues up here. And then there's a paper. I, I looked through the EOS uh, uh, the submissions to this meeting as far as I could, and there's very few papers that really address this question of precipitation, possible connection uh, to the atmosphere. But this one I selected out as so. At the fall AGU, there's often papers on sprites and jets and those kinds of things. Well, I do, as I said, you can slice these di data other ways. And I have put these into other categories as well. Papers under development. Papers that are really, if one knew the answers to these, one could de design out many solar terrestrial processes in a system. For example, if we knew solar proton fluxes over five solar cycles, I would address that. Uh, these sessions on comparative studies of solar activity are really important for, that, for this aspect of development, I think. Uh, ICMEs and elevated iron charge states. Sounds very esoteric, but if one understood differences in, in interplanetary coronal mass ejections, one might be able to design those out, too, in some ways. Now, I know that's uh, debatable, but I, that's how I would look at this. Uh, properties of CMEs, the large scale solar flare productivity. Solar cycle variability of the solar wind, uh, talked by Ipovich here, possibly would give us some insight to designing out a lot of, a lot of issues. Ionospheric climatology over Millstone Hill, we saw that earlier. Now, so there's some applied research I would classify these. Uh, targeted research, new understanding toward applicability. Automatic detecting of sigmoids in solar x-ray images. It's not an, I want to use this as an, as, as to emphasize one point. It's not enough to be able to model CMEs from the sun to the earth and understand everything about solar terrestrial research. Solar radio bursts don't result from CMEs. They may result from CMEs, but within eight minutes, they are at earth and they're affecting a radar system. The CMEs come along at their leisure, many, minutes late, many hours later, as we all know. So this technology that's affected is very dependent upon the solar terrestrial process that one wants to look at and vice versa. And there's a set of others here as well that's more applied with search, forecasting large storms, the role of casting. And then at the meeting, there are a fair number of papers that are of operational models and model validation. And uh, I, I don't have time to go over this. Folks up here in the first row are very nervous, so I won't go over this in detail. But this issue of model validation is a very interesting one and a very important one from the point of view of government and private enterprise. Model validation is an issue in terms of government procurement and installation of, of uh, models that is a very detailed and often bureaucratic process to validate a model, to make sure it's reasonable, to make sure it can be used in a system. However, model validation in the private sector is quite different. If I can convince you to buy something from me, you'll buy it and use it. If it's valid, you'll continue using it. If it's not valid, you'll either not buy the next thing from me or you'll tell me to, to change it. It's a very different situation if I'm a private, uh, if I'm a private sector uh, purchaser or if I'm a government purchaser. So the validation system is really very different in, so in terms of solar terrestrial uh, aspects of space weather. And I'm sorry that I don't have enough time to go into that. There were another couple of policy issues that I wanted to address, which you're not going to let me. But I will anyway. Do you mind, Roberta? Okay. Well. Um, I want to emphasize uh, three things here. I won't go to policy reality number two, I promise you. <laughs> Present day technologies affected by space phenomena are very dynamic, especially uh, telecommunications communications in general, military, commercial, and regulated power. These technologies cannot wait for optimum knowledge to be acquired before new embodiments are created, implemented, and marketed. 
those companies and even government agencies who seek perfectionist understanding can be left behind in the marketplace. And a balance is needed between deeper understanding of physical phenomena and engineering solutions to current crises. And that's basically what we have in space weather oftentimes. Government, government agencies can't wait till we know perfect space weather before we apply high surveillance, high bit rate cameras over certain sectors of the world and that are hot military targets. Neither can some companies uh, wait until perfect understanding of space is known before embodiments of new technologies of communications are implemented. And so oftentimes we as researchers get too uh, concentrated on the basic research and we don't think about the applied, the development, and the targeted research enough. So I had a few examples, but I won't, and I would just like to summarize with uh, this final view graph that uh, is part of what I showed before. The increasing sophistication of technologies, all of which are, many of which are illustrated up here, and how they relate to the environments in which they are embedded means that ever more sophisticated understanding of physical phenomena is needed. But we need to make sure we cut our research in these various ways, from applied to practical and from operational to models and to validation. Thank you. I'm sorry. Uh, we can take a few questions. Yes. Yes, Jane. Uh, well, because I... Uh, I was concentrating, let's see, give me an example of uh, I don't know. I mean, you you I know that there are a lot of things that have to be in place because of the so it's not that definition before you know what's going on. The, I think the, um, the use of space weather is basically based upon deleterious effects on technologies. And uh, what the definition might be up for, uh, up for uh, a discussion, but that's, that's generally been uh, what has been used. And I don't know of any benefits of space weather on technology. But I could be that I, I, uh, I, have, uh, I have a mindset that's a little, well, little tangential. But Yeah, well, but they never build a telegraph to do, they never build a telegraph to do that. So, uh, uh, yeah, okay. Yeah. I suppose you saved on battery power. But you see, when 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 Arthur Clarke back in the uh, 1940s predicted uh, and advocated communication satellites, predicted communication satellites, and when John John Pearson, you know, implemented what was the father of communication satellites, Telstar One and the Echo, they never expected that the space environment was anything but benign. And so benign is the operative word there. If it's not benign, then it must be del deleterious. So I guess I would, uh, that's, uh, that's my mindset. I'm, I'm, I'm open to uh, changes. Maybe Dan has a... <laughs> yeah, well, there is a tourist industry going to see the Aurora. I guess if you were in Alaska, you would consider that beneficial. Uh, and, and, yeah. Any other questions? Go ahead. Well, I, th I think one has to be a little broader than just operations. Uh, it's not just, see, when you have operations, you have, uh, you, you think of models. And when you think of models, often folks think about end-to-end uh, uh, -end systems and just the safe operation of systems. But, but there's also this aspect of, uh, of designing out problems. And then you don't need operations for that, for example. Uh, there are other uh, there are other systems that you want to operate or do want to exist without operations as well. 
And so you have to be a little broader than just uh, just the research uh, communicating with operations and operations with research. Research has to communicate with designers and with implementers as well. Uh, and, and there is a journal that, that covers some of that now, and that's a journal of spacecraft and rockets, where I published several papers related to this uh, thing. But it does, a uh, journal of spacecraft and rockets, for example, does not address some of the ground-based issues, which are really very important. Uh, so I, I can't comment on the merits of, of the journal, but, but I think you have to think broader than just operations and the operational validity of models and how you validate models. I would like to just, I'd like to have the opportunity to discuss models and validation uh, and much broader and more deeply than uh, we've had here at the time this morning. But uh, we don't have time we because have you're time. standing here next to me. One more question. Well, I, uh, I concentrated here on natural phenomena, uh, but you're, you're, you're of course correct. And at, at LEO, where we already have a lot of both uh, military and civilian assets, uh, space debris is an issue at LEO, low Earth orbit, uh, for those of you non-space physicists here. Uh, but I, I, I concentrate on uh, the natural phenomena. But you're absolutely right, uh, going forward, one has to uh, and, and if one has a journal or something, then one, uh, uh, one would want to uh, broaden that. Yeah, you're right, Jim. Any other questions? I'd like to thank our speaker again.